Let's uh, start off with number 405, Wonderful Words of Life, and then we'll have a prayer. Wonderful Words of Life is what we are looking forward to this week. Let's sing with the Spirit and with the understanding. 405, Wonderful Words of Life. Hold up, Jerry. Let him get it on the Yeah, this is the wrong songbook for pews. All right, thank you, Trevor. shelter and all things that makes life more pleasurable for us heavenly father we are so thankful but we are truly thankful for the gift you have given us through christ jesus that was willing to go to the cross and shed his blood that we may have remission for our sins heavenly father in a home in heaven one day with thee if we only obey thy will and follow thy word we ask heavenly father that you be with our nation at this time, the turmoil that's going on in it and be with our rulers, Heavenly Father. And we hope and pray that they would look to thy word, Heavenly Father, to where they make the decisions to lead this country, Heavenly Father. We ask that you be with the world in general, Heavenly Father, with all the conflicts and things that are going on. 
and, and be with our enemies, and may they have a change of heart, Heavenly Father, and that the world may have peace once again. We know that, Heavenly Father, that thou art in control of all things. We ask, dear Heavenly Father, that you forgive us of our sins, Heavenly Father, where we may have failed thee and we fall, fall short, and we confess those sins and, and remove them and never go, return to them, Heavenly Father. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you be with the speaker of the hour, that he have a kind recollections of the things he has prepared and brings to us, that we can apply them to our everyday walks of life, that we may be better Christians in the future. And we hope and pray, Heavenly Father, that there's some, if there's someone here that's outside the ark of safety, that something may be said or done, that they come to thee before everlasting too late. And give them time and opportunity, Heavenly Father. We ask that you be with those that are less fortunate, those that are in nursing homes and those in assisted livings and bless them, Heavenly Father. We ask now, Heavenly Father, that you be with us as we go into the hour and watch over us, guide and direct us and everything we do may be pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. from uh, anything other than the uh, announcement that was handed out. I'm Mike McLemore. I have lived in Huntsville, Alabama for the last almost 15 years. And I um, am Emily's father. My wife Gwen is with me today. Emily is our youngest of three daughters. And of course we uh, are very happy that we have three sons to go with those daughters that we didn't have to raise, we didn't have to pay for, and we didn't have to educate. But um, that really brings me to a very special uh, matter for me, and that is Terry Benton, because he has been a great encouragement, not just to our Trenton, but to our other son-in-law, Brian Garlock, who is also a preacher. And Terry has, for many years, been associated with Brian, has been a great encouragement to him. They are uh, very good friends, and he has learned, Brian has learned so much from Terry. I've enjoyed watching Terry for a long time before we ever met on their program that they do online from time to time, and have found him to be a great voice of wisdom and a stalwart example of a man who stands for truth, and you're very blessed to have him here with you. And I'm happy to be here. It's the first time we've been able to do anything together other than be at a birthday party. And so uh, I'm happy to, to come. Thank you for asking me to do that. Uh, you're going to need your cell phone this morning, believe it or not. All of you, do you, do you have a cell phone? No, not <laughs> You've got to get it. You're going to have to reach and get it. Anybody got a cell phone? <coughs> Um, this phone, this electronic device is, I'm afraid, going to be the death of us. Uh, I was last Friday evening sitting with my family, uh, with our oldest daughter, Amanda, and Jared, her husband, and their two children, and we were having dinner at, at Slim Chicken. And we were enjoying our company, but next to us, right next to us at a table, was a very distinguished couple. It, they were a mixed race couple. Uh, the gentleman was very nicely dressed, certainly as nicely or maybe more so than I am right now, at a dinner table at Slim Chicken, if you could imagine that. His wife had a, a polo kind of uh, top on that said war college and I knew immediately that she was a military person. Uh, she later would put on a, a jacket that announced that she was in the army or had been in the army, probably working at Redstone. They had two beautiful children, a young son, uh, an older teenage daughter, very nicely dressed, uh, and I could not help but notice that uh, as they were having their dinner, he was on his phone doing something. 
his wife was on her phone doing something, maybe something important. The little boy had a tablet, uh, and that's what really got my attention. He was watching something, maybe a game, I'm not certain, but he had headphones on. I mean, full-fledged headphones on. The young daughter was on her phone, and she was busy doing her thing and making pictures and videos and those kinds of things. And that went on the whole time they were there. The only words I ever heard said were said to the son by the father, you need to eat your food, after being prompted by his wife to tell him to do so. Uh, the little boy, as they got up, the next words that were said as they were leaving was, you need to go wash your hands. That was the entirety of the conversation that took place at that table. Now, I'm telling you that not to speak embarrassingly about that family. I'm certain they're a wonderful family. Those children will probably grow up to do great things. I, I believe, just believe only the good about that. But that cannot be good for us, guys. It can't be good for us. And before we look down our condescending nose at anyone else, we are guilty of the same. I often will chide people when I meet them for the first time. A man sitting there next to his wife, maybe they're waiting for a dinner table. Seems like we wait a lot to go out to eat, but anyway. Uh, and I'll see them, one on their phone, the other on their phone, and I'll always ask them the same thing. Are you two talking to each other? <laughs> now... Let me just say to you, last night I was doing a few details on the lesson that we're going to have uh, later this morning uh, in the chair, and I looked over and my son-in-law was on one end of the couch and my daughter-in-law was on the other end of the couch, both of them on their telephones, and it became apparent to me that Trenton had probably sent Emily something and they laughed at what they were sending each other. So it was clear to me they were talking to each other. Guys, the phone's going to be the death of us. It's going to be the death of us. It's robbing us of conversation. It's robbing us of relationships. It's robbing us, especially our children, of learning how to communicate any other way than through an electronic device. Now I look out at this audience and I realize that most of our behavior patterns are already formed. You have many young people. Certainly you're associated with many young people. Young people are being dramatically, profoundly, forevermore impacted by what's happening on their telephone. And we need to wake up to that truth. There are so many forces of evil that are being brought into our homes and into our minds and finding their place in our hearts that start with that gateway of the devil. It's put us more in touch with information and with each other than we have ever been in the history of humankind. But it is also destroying us from within. We need to be aware of the impact that that's having upon our young hearts. I'm here to talk to young people this morning. And of course, maybe by extension, uh, is this thing going to work, Trent? Oh, i got to turn it on, maybe. Yeah, there we go. Uh, this, um, my, my assignment is to talk to young people and talk to, about, talk to them about the the need for morality in their own lives and, and decisions that they are facing today that are unlike any decision that many of us have ever faced on some level. But I'm going to show you how they're all interconnected to one another. Solomon said in the first chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes that one generation passes away and another comes. It's true, isn't it? I'm not sure how many generations we have in this room. We may have as many as five generations in this room right now. There are certainly four that are here. When Solomon said there is nothing new under the sun, I believe that our little Evelyn, who left, well, there were five here a minute ago, uh, will face challenges that are no different at all than someone who was born, let me just say a number here, before 1933. That would make you 90 years old. Do we have anyone in this room? You have to raise your hand now. 
who was born before 1933. Is there anybody? Everyone was born after 1933. Well, someone was certainly born before 1943, which would make you 80 years old. A, a couple. We won't notice anybody but the fellows. Let's just do that. <laughs> Let me just ask you. I want to ask you, and I need you, to, I need you to speak out. I need you to speak out quickly. Um, what was the most difficult challenge that teenagers or children face when you were little, if you were born before 1933, what was the big challenge? What, what do you think it was that, that really faced people we had to deal with? Anybody? Well, learning to be subjected or subject to your parents. And I think that was the biggest problem. You know, when they lay down a law to you, and sometimes it's hard to follow that law. You didn't understand why they had been so tough on you. I think that was the biggest thing I was confronted with. Obeying your parents. Obeying your parents. Well, let, me, let me give you some more numbers here. Someone who was born after World War II, 1944, realized the war was still going on, but 1944 to what? About 19... Uh, what's my number? I forget what my number is. Uh, uh, 44 to say 1959. That was some, maybe my number. In that age range. What was your... We've got a few of those, right? Some of you were born after 1959? All right. Or, or before 1959? All right. What was your big challenge? What was it that you dealt with that you believe was the, the most difficult thing that you dealt with in your lifetime? And the, the biggest challenge, what was that? Peer pressure. The pressure in relationships, Right. And what were the kinds of things that, that really were the big challenge of that era, of that group of people? What were your peers wanting you to do? I'm not saying you did it. <laughs> you don't have to admit to anything. Use vile language. Bad language. We've moved pretty far from just being able to understand why your father insisted on a particular thing to the language that we use. That's, we're down the road little ways aren't we on that foul language what were some other things that maybe you know you can't say smoking there because there was nothing wrong with it back in those days they thought i have articles written by preachers uh, about they were they were discussing the possibility that may have a health problem if, if it's so then it wouldn't be something a christian ought to do but you see those kinds of things had not really evolved yet foul language all right, let's say someone who was born after 1963, or after 1960, 1960, to say 1993. Let me get a little closer to our time. How many of you were born during that time period? I was born in that period. I'm 60 years old. What do you suppose our big challenge was? I know what it was, but what, what do you suppose our generation faced? What were our peers trying to get us to do? I'm sorry? Drugs. Drugs. Some, some did. You know, I had one boy in my class, I had a class of 99, my graduating class. We have one boy who used drugs in our class. Just one. Only one. And, and he was using marijuana, I suppose. He'd come to class kind of that way. Uh, drugs. Something else? I was thinking of something else. Alcohol. 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 Now, it's not that they didn't drink before that. Let, let me speak up. Yes, sir, please do. I'm getting sick and tired of that commercial that comes on about this hard iced tea. <laughs> Amen. And the reason being, one can of beer will cause you to be intoxicated. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. But they're coming on, and you see these young people just flocking to that yeah. painted up yellow wagon, and the lid goes down. And young people. Stay away from that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's hard, it's hard, it's, uh, excuse me, strong drink in the Bible. It just is. That's what it is. And strong drink was everywhere always condemned. But they pass it off as good stuff. All right, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. I'm going to come over here in a minute. I was a young preacher. I'd only been preaching a, a couple of years or so over in Houston, Mississippi. That's where I began my work. 
My grandfather, who was a stalwart preacher, James W. Adams, he was a very well-known preacher, he came and held a meeting for us. We were sitting on Sunday afternoon uh, in my living room, and I think we were watching golf. And a commercial came on, and it was a hilarious commercial. And I laughed at it. My grandfather looked over at me, he says, I'm not going to bite. It was a beer commercial. You know, they know how to get us, don't they? They know how to try to make it look like it is a good thing. It's going to make me better, going to make life better, make life more fun. Well, that really kind of opened my eyes to that. And I began to be far more aware after that than I was. I'm sick of that stuff too, brother. Over here, you had something. Our children were born during that time, and it was sexual immorality. All right. It, it is coming on, isn't it? Uh, fornication, let's just call it what the Bible calls it. Immoral behavior began to be far more prevalent. Uh, than, not that it was not, you see. I had a great aunt who conceived a child out of wedlock. Uh, very early, she would have, she would have uh, conceived sometime in the early 1940s. It was a very a scandalous sort of thing. But it, it, those kinds of things happened before that. But they were in the darkness, were they not? And it began to be more prevalent, didn't it? Far more prevalent. How many young people in my class of 99 who conceived children before they graduated from high school? There were several. All right. Sexual immorality. Now, here's what I, I want to do this morning. I want to, to show you a pattern of digression that's prevalent in every culture. It's not just confined to American culture. We've seen over the last less than 100 years a, a big jump from just being able to respect our parents' command. And we never would have dreamed of going against it. But it was hard. Two, flagrant and open sexual morality. I'm going to talk more about what's going on in our generation in just a moment. But our young people right now, those children that were born after that time period of 1993 moving forward, they are facing challenges the likes of which we never could have conceived in our country and in our communities. But in the book of Judges, in the second chapter of the book of Judges, we're told the story of a generation that rose up that did not know the Lord or the works that He had done in their nation. They didn't know it. And we're a bit moving into a period of time exactly like that. And how quickly have we done it? In about four generations. And the end of where this thing is going to end up, we don't know, do we? We've kind of gone through the issues that confront generations. Let me see if I can condense some of these things. Because we haven't touched on a lot of things yet. Emerging in the 1960s, the period of rebellion. Now, my, my parents were raising their children in that time period. They began to see a generation of people that, that began to be given publicity, wide publicity, who were overcome with rampant unbelief. Now, I realize you can't see the little bitty print. I'm going to tell you what that says. It's okay. I don't, you don't have to see that. Rampant unbelief. Now what that involved was the, the movement, the evolutionary movement that began to find its place in our schools. When our schools were taken away from community control and moved to Washington, and they began to be able to influence with money what was being taught in schools. And evolution began to take the place of creationism. That had been openly espoused in classrooms all over the country. But we've seen that move far further than that. We've seen these humanistic philosophies that follow evolution that says that we are the, not of the product of a divine mind who governs us, but in fact we are a people who are left to ourselves to live and let live. Well, that's the jungle book theory of Mr. Kipling, isn't it, from 1894 of the, the theory that governed the lives of wolves. And what it amounted to was the fit survive and nobody else does. Might makes right. Who has the goal makes the rule. All of that. This humanistic theory that has followed evolution has found its way into the fabric, every thread of the fabric of American society. 
global climate change. You know what the, the foundation of global climate change is? That man is in control completely of his environment and that the biblical text that says that God not only created all things, but that he sustains all things by the word of his power, it denies that absolutely. Do you believe that your SUV is going to be in, in mass, is going to be able to change the climate so as not to be able to live here? That is, that's saying that you have the power, man has the power to thwart and overcome the word of God's power that sustains all things. That's the promise we have from him. Veganism. Now I use that word, so vegetarianism. I didn't, there may be some of you who do not eat meat. That's okay. You may do that because of dietary matters. You may see that as a healthy lifestyle. One of my most impactful friends in my life, a man named Jack Eastham, does not eat meat. That's his choice. He does it for health. And boy, he's a picture of health. He is, I, I choose another way. But do you know what the foundation of that entire doctrine is? That, that the animals themselves essentially are more important than the people of this world. That thwarts God's command that we have a charge, that we have dominion over the created things of this earth. I'm not saying that we misuse or abuse anything, plant life or animal life. But at the bottom of that theory is unbelief, ladies and gentlemen. The declining family, the divorce rates. You think they were bad in the 1950s? The divorce rates among couples that are married for the second time are approaching 75%. Multiple divorces. The mental health issues that grow out of of, of families, I described what's happening with us in our phones, our electronic devices. The isolation and anxiety that goes along with that. Do you know what American teenagers are more concerned with than anything else? A poll's taken, do you know what it was? Their cell phone. And whether they would have charge or not, whether it would be sufficiently charged to use. Or that something might happen to it, that it might crash, or that it might lose their photos. Horrific. That's what people are concerned about. Peer conflict. The, the influence of peer conflict. Have you noticed one of the real problems in schools today? It's what? what? What's happening in schools? You have pacifists growing up in, 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 in the same environment, in the same petri dish with children who are completely ungoverned at home. And what do you have? Brutality. Bullying, that's the big conversation in schools. It's a result of the declining family. Raging immorality, not just in the darkness, but raging immorality, <coughs> pornography. Ladies and gentlemen, this thing right here is one click away from the nastiest filth that is known to humankind. And if your children have a cell phone, you need to know what they're seeing and what they're able to see. Fornication that goes along with that. Homosexuality. Here's what's happening to our culture. We are in a spiral decline to the pit of depravity. That's where we're going. That's where our children are going. That is the world they're growing up in. You just take a look around you. And it's not just in Huntsville, Alabama, or Birmingham, Alabama, or Nashville, Tennessee, or Hollywood, California. It's everywhere. Why? Because the images are right here. Substance abuse, alcoholism, drugs, vaping, smoking. Those things are common, are they not? And each and every one of those substances are a form of drug. That's what they are. Don't kid yourself. It's strong drink. I don't care what name they call it. And then this gender identity crisis. Here are some words that you're going to hear. Inclusivity, diversity, equity, inclusion. You're going to hear those words. I bet you're hearing them in the schools in Bell Green, Alabama. Maybe, maybe not. I, realize I grew up in a rural school. I know what, 
I know what that's like. It's a little different than it is in other places. But it's not altogether different. You know what this is coming from? Children who have anxiety about their body type or whether or not they're getting along. They're not getting along with their peers the way they do. And they have people, their own peers, who are telling them, you know, you're in the wrong body. That's what's wrong. And the person says, oh, really? Google search. It's everywhere. Teachers who will affirm that. Parents who don't know what to do and just simply are trying to help their children be happy. But what this is, is the bottom of the, of the well of depravity. That's what it is. These are the issues that our children are facing. And they're not going to get better. They're going to get worse. They're not going to get better. As a matter of fact, they won't get better until our, our empire, like the Roman Empire, completely collapses and resets. That's the end. Now, I'm not here to preach gloom and doom. I'm just saying that that's where we're going. And how do we know that's where we're going? Well, I want to show you. How do we handle that? What do we, we have to find a benchmark. You know, every building has a, a benchmark that's set out away from the structure that is a point of reference for every other thing as the foundation is being laid. To find level and square and all of those things. You have a benchmark over here, a, a place. That they call it in Scripture. It finds its, its evidence in Scripture as a cornerstone, a place of reference. And that place of reference is critical. And it's actually available to culture universally. If you have a man who's living wholly toward for himself, he's seek, here's what we say, he's seeking to find himself. He's on the decline, the plain decline toward depravity. That's where he's going. He'll end in ruin if he continues to try to find his answers in himself. Then you have another person who's pursuing God. He is on an ascent. I don't know if it's God, but a higher power, that's what they tend to call it. But he's, he's looking for the answers. He's looking for for the answer for himself. He's searching for the origin. Maybe that's a good way to say it. I believe that at both of those places, that both of those, on both of those planes, there's going to be a point of intersection. And that point of intersection is God. The person who is looking, is who is declining, he, he begins to realize fairly quickly, as he begins to move quickly, he begins to realize there is no answer in myself. There has to be something better than this. I'm hurting. I don't understand. I feel like dying all the time. What would happen to me if I die? That person is the prodigal when he hit the bottom. And he begins to look for some point of reference. The person who's on the ascent begins to search for God. He looks out and he sees the heavens. And they're declaring the glory of God every day, every night. They're preaching. And if he searches very far at all, He'll find a communication from his creator, the Bible. And if he will open his heart and read it for understanding, he can find God. That was the message of Paul to the Athenian culture that was rapidly on the, the, the descent into depravity. He's not very far from one of us if you'll seek after him. Acts chapter 17. Now, Here's what I want you to see that you'll find at that benchmark, at that place of reference. You'll find God as the answer for our origin. We're not here just happenstance. You look at the universal design, not just of the, of the, the universe itself, not just our solar system, not just our uh, ecological arrangement here in this, in this world, but the human body, you. God is the answer for your origin. But God also is the standard of authority. It seems absolutely essential for people to understand that if God is creator, then it is axiomatic that he is the standard of government for his creation. Do we have an engineer here in the room? You create something, you know what it's designed to do, you've planned it that way, and when it doesn't function that way, you know something's wrong. You're in charge of that. God is in charge of us. He is the architect of civilization. We talked about those peer influences in every generation. A, a young man trying to understand uh, why his father is asking him to do certain things. 
God is the architect of civilization. We need look no further than His Word. And God has placed fathers under a great responsibility to not provoke their children to wrath, but to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. He's the architect of civilization. He, is, he has made us male and female. He made us perfectly suited to one another. I don't care what any psychologist tells you. That's how God created us. He is the architect of civilization one man one woman for life he is the model of morality i say the model because his divine nature has given us a, a model that is essentially circumspect on every level jesus came and modeled the perfect life the sinless life and he demonstrated and then left us four records of the same and then he left us a whole bunch of commentary on the four records of the same. He's shown us what his expectations are from the beginning of civilization as he tried to govern his creation. He's given us the proof of immortality. What's the motive for all of this? What's, what, what is it that's that the impetus that's really going to move me, that's going to get me going to realize that this is the pursuit of, that is worth every effort that I can make. Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Conquering death. You see, here's the one thing. The person that is on the descent to depravity or the other person who is searching for the answers for his origin and leading ultimately to skepticism, ultimately it will. He'll never find his answer in science. Jesus is the proof of immortality. All of us are going to die, no matter which direction we're going. We're all going to die. And nobody has an answer for that, do they? Except God. And we have the proof of that in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now, we've done a lot of talking. What's the getting out time for class, Terry? Four out till. How many? Quarter till. At a quarter till. All right. In Judges, turn to Judges chapter 2 with me. Now, this class, if you say, well, that book preacher didn't do anything but a bunch of talking. Well, that's what this was going to be. That's what this is going to be this morning. Turn to, to Judges, the second chapter with me. I'm going to begin reading with you in verse 6. When Joshua dismissed the people uh, of Israel, uh, excuse me, when Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works that the Lord had done in Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at age 110. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance at Timnath Ares, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gaish. And all that generation also <coughs> were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the works that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from uh, among the, the gods of the people who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Asheroth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies, so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, and the Lord had warned, as the Lord had warned them, and as the Lord has warned them. And they were in terrible distress. I want you to notice some things in that text. We have all of the things we talked about in that text. All, all the things. We have the influences of, uh, of the surrounding peers. We have children who are struggling to understand and follow their parents. We have immorality. That's what the Baals and the Ashtaroths all involved. We had all of those things. All of, the, all of the problems of society that we have today in mass, they had then. And they had them in increasing measure. Why? Because they allowed a gateway into their life. That's what they did. What you have in, in Judges chapter 2 and verse 6 through 10 is a model of digression. It's the decline. A generation, <coughs> Joshua, 
<coughs> was the only one, he and Caleb, were above the age of 20 among the males that survived from Egypt. All the rest of them died in the wilderness. That means there were a lot of graves in the wilderness, weren't there? And there were children that were born in the wilderness. There were little kids, the people who were under the age of 20, who came out of Egypt. They had seen all the miracles. They were at Sinai. They saw the events that surrounded the golden calf. They saw the people swallowed up by the earth. They saw the rebellion. They heard the mocking. They heard all that. They saw God's response. The serpents biting them. The, the brazen uh, snake that was raised up upon which they could look and survive. They saw all of those things. And they were impressed by that. And they believed God all of their lives. And they served the Lord all of their lives. You remember the promise that Joshua made? Choose, or at the question he asked them to make a choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And he assured that it's for me and my house will serve the Lord. And the people responded to that in Joshua 24. And they said, we will do that. Joshua said, you don't know what you're asking. He says, no, we do and we will. And they did. And it was marvelous. I think back to what our society was like many years ago when... You were a little boy. Uh, everybody believed in the Lord, didn't they? Virtually. Most people believed in God. They don't believe in God like that anymore. Most people don't go anywhere. Maybe they do out here where we are, but they don't in Huntsville where I am. They just don't. Our society is moving away from the belief in God. This generation stood out as an example. And their children mirrored them. There is a a hiding generation in this language. <coughs> it doesn't move as it seems from that generation who believed and served the Lord to a generation who absolutely didn't believe in God and didn't, didn't care. There was a generation in the middle here. A generation of people who were born in the wilderness and who were born after they came into the land of Canaan. And they saw the faithful stalwart example of their parents and of their grandparents. Uh, and, and they mirrored their ancestors. They stood for it. They, they were not as convinced. They had not seen the miracles the way their others, their ancestors had. But they mirrored their ancestors. But they were not as fully and completely devoted as was the generation ahead of them who, who loved and served the Lord all their lives. And then it comes to this generation, a generation who abandoned God completely. You know something? We are losing more than half of our children to the world as soon as they leave high school. Did you know that? Where, does that frighten you? Maybe some of you have experienced that. And you've seen that. And, and you and the thing that keeps you up at night is concern for the soul of your children or your grandchildren. This is a generation who abandoned God. Those, those, those people had the same problems that we have. They had the same worries and the same concerns of the souls of those who were going out after the Baals and who were worshiping and intermarrying among the people. And that generation completely abandoned God to the point that God abandoned them. And the, the closing statement in, in verses 14 and 15 of our reading this morning, this generation suffered greatly. <coughs> They suffered distress. They were distressed greatly. A profound, a profound ruin of a nation that began so wonderfully with a beneficent and a graceful God who led them out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery, who delivered them from that army, never to be encroached upon again by the, by the Egyptians, defeated the Amalekites, gave them a law, the highest form of law known to humankind, we still base laws on the laws that were given it in Mount Sinai. Cultures do all over this world. God's uh, orders for how to live. The architect of civilization showing what real good life and government looks like. And they turned away from it. In, in about three, maybe four generations, they completely turned away from that. What's our concern? My concern, and your concern ought to be, am I going to perpetuate that model of digression? Or will I do something about it? Will I watch the former generation die in the wilderness and believe God and serve in the minority? 
Somebody said this to me a long time ago, uh, several months ago actually, several months ago. We were talking about what's happening into our culture and how Christians are being treated. And I was pretty upset about that. And I was kind of tearing my shirt about that here and there in a, in a sermon here and there. And he, he and I sat down and we had a long conversation about that. He said, you know something, Mike? He says, I think what we really need to learn to do is we need to learn how to live in the minority. We haven't been living in the minority in, in American culture. Most people believed in God. Most people understood a standard of morality. That's not true anymore. And we will be ridiculed and we will be mocked and we will be mistreated. We may even be beaten. We may be even be jailed. I don't know what the end of this will be, but we have to learn to live the way Paul and Silas and Timothy and Dr. Luke and all of those lived as they lived in persecution under the hand of the authority that didn't like what they taught or didn't like what they stood for and didn't like how they lived. They lived in the minority, and we're going to have to learn to do that. The question is, Joshua chose. I have to choose now. Well, that's where we're going next. And so I, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much.